This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction um, and for you know putting out loud the title so we can move on to it. Um, before I, I dive into the, the subject, I'll just make a very brief introduction of you know why how I ended up working in greenhouse gases wasn't my original idea, right? Um, or, or when I uh, was in grad school, but during the postdoc, I worked in a project that was called uh, climate, uh, climate, excuse me, climate friendly farming. And you know, it was kind of a dive in into all aspects related to what is today uh, so relevant. That was many years ago. We don't need to know how long ago. All right, so let's get to it. So I'll give you a two minute run on, on, a, on a conceptual framework just, just to land into the subject. Nitrous oxide is a small molecule, uh, plays a, a very important role, but it doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from all the stuff that we do to our land. If we conceive you know, the provision of ecosystem services in an axis there, conceptual axis and agricultural output in the other axis, you, know, you can think of the natural systems provides a set of relatively limited agricultural output. You know, they are not meant to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, also production of ecosystem services. Um, it's kind of a conceptual low input system. Um, the Green Revolution essentially, and in our historic trajectory has been towards systems that are a bit more intensive and that produce a lot of output, but that have a very high um, footprint on the environment or, or, you know, lower provision of ecosystem services. You know, they are high input, low, bi low biological diversity. They produce a lot of externalities. And our goal is to move into this the side of the scale. So this is essentially, you know, that second arrow going up is in the business that we are now trying to move the system in that direction. Uh, we really occupy most of the land in terms of uh, whatever is habitable. We are, we are in it. The footprint is, is you know, it's, it's pretty pretty large. This is some sort of level of, um, you know, how the landscape has been uh, changed by humans. This doesn't necessarily mean that is. Bad, but it means that we are everywhere, India, China, Europe, uh, the eastern part of the United States around the lakes, parts of South America, um, the parts of the green that are less inhabited that are affected are either the Saharan, uh, the Taiga and that area, you know, Greenland and parts of the, parts of the rainforest. Um, but in general, we affect a lot of the land. Uh, do we produce enough food? We, there is a lot of talk about food security. Well, we produce a lot and cheaply, you know, um, in quotation marks, uh, is of course not well distributed. Mm. Let me move some things that I can see here. Um, here is a figure for the US of the increase in the yield of corn, for instance. And, and I bring up this uh, graph that we all know very well if we work in this business that corn productivity has been going up. So has been that of many crops in some areas, it might stagnate a little bit. But the reason I bring it up is because when we, communicate with producers so that people that is related to agricultural production, not necessarily to academia. Um, and we talk about the challenges of climate change, what they have in mind, maybe without thinking explicitly about it, is that productivity is going up. So there is a bit of a mismatch in the message between, okay, we know we may be facing uh, dramatic challenges ahead and what they are experiencing with increased productivity. That doesn't mean that there aren't uh, big challenges, but we need to make an effort to bridge you know, a complex concept, which is climate change and how it affects many parts of the globe at once, but not every day or every season in the same way and what they people observe in the field. But back to this figure, um, you know, we can see just an example of the, our productivity. We are very familiar with this. The Midwestern USA is, uh, is a powerhouse in terms of production at the cost, essentially, of affecting all the land. This, are just, uh, this is corn soy, for instance, uh, the green-yellow color. Uh, it's the similar case in Argentina, you know, in the Pampas, excuse me, here. Uh, and it's changing recently in Paraguay, as we will see, and, and in the arc of the forestation, you know, in the Amazon basin. So, message, we produce a lot. Uh, of course, the production is not well distributed around the world. You know, to the left, we see uh, uh, in, in red color what is some sort of index of poverty. And, and you can see red, mostly in Africa. It's also good to consider the size of Africa. With the, with the mass and with the population that it has for continents. And this is one in which it is 
deformed to represent the production of cereals in which there are a few giants, the United States, Europe, if it is considered as a whole, uh, China, India, and the likes. And of course, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is completely compressed, you know, compared with its land demand. So we produce a lot, we don't distribute it, uh, or it is not distributed, better said, um, evenly. Nothing new. There is also uh, a lot of uh, land use change, which you know I was glad to see in the recent report of the IPCC that this is getting a bit more attention. We all we all knew that it was severe, but we I wasn't sure that everybody had a sense of the magnitude of the challenge there. Um, here is a map, for example, of South America, and the little square represents this area. It's called El Chaco, which is a region that most of you maybe never heard of it. Uh, but it was one of the last deciduous forests uh, in the subtropics that we have. You know, this is in part of Argentina, this is in part of Paraguay, this is in part of Bolivia. And, you know, it's kind of a continuation of the Cerrado of Brazil that I'm sure you did hear about. And the yellow color here is the area lost since the 2000s, right? It's such a massive area. This is about maybe two times the size of, or, or roughly the size of Pennsylvania, maybe larger uh, in just 20 years. So. Sometimes when we try to lower uh, agricultural intensity in some areas, we better make sure that the only thing that we are doing is just pushing it elsewhere, which is really a tragedy in both ends, right? Or can be a tragedy in both ends. Um, this is related to some of the current challenges in the world. For example, a crop failure in a poor country that doesn't have the capacity to uh, replenish uh, food supply with imports, you know, will cause social unrest. After social unrest, we will get, in some cases, forced migration. Forced migration will put a stress on the receiving country, right? Uh, because in general, countries are not organized to receive in the thousands or sometimes millions of, of, of refugees of some sort, of migrants. That causes social unrest in the receiving country. And some countries react, you know, trying to build a wall. Um, this is not uh, this is not a real, a real joke of sorts. It's just the reality of what we are living through now, and and even though the standards of living in the world, on average, are increasing, the number of displaced people can be very large. And a problem in one place spills over in another place. There is no such a thing as a disconnected world. So sustainability is relevant in many regards. Um, when we think about nitrogen globally, I will ask you to keep in mind this figure. This is from 2004. It's a little old, but I think it will convey the message. Uh, we move a lot of nitrogen around the world. Uh, some of it is through um, the production and export or import of fertilizers. So this, you know, just look at the thickness of the arrows, try not to memorize the numbers, it's not the point. Um, but there is a lot of nitrogen that is produced industrially, you know, and added again, for example, in Europe as fertilizer. So as the case in North America, some of it is imported, uh, some of it is exported. And then the grain produced with most of that fertilizer will be traded. You can see that, of course, not all the nitrogen that is added uh, is exported or move around, just a fraction of it. And some of it is consumed, some of it is used to feed animals, some of it is used for biofuels. And finally, some of it is also traded, you know, as meat. And you can see from the original, lot of production and trade of fertilizer to the thinner uh, arrows of, of um, nitrogen that is traded in meat on different types of, of meat. Um, you know, we can get an idea of this, the, the, the arrows will get smaller, which means that nitrogen is being lost along the way, you know, in other compartments that are not the ones that we are trading around. So that's the type, that's the nitrogen that we are dealing with the one that is lost. Um, and this is what happened in, in a region that you know well. I can move very quickly through it. The bar on top shows the, the area of forest in the Chesapeake Bay, the area of hay crops, pasture, cropland, and urban, roughly you know, in proportion. You know, the size of the bar is a proportion for the occupying the bay. And this is the proportion of nitrogen load that comes from each land. And you know, goes from a very small proportion in terms of, of total area because forest dominates the bay. And, but a very sizable uh, component of the, of the nitrogen pollution. So that 26 means 26, 26, on average, 26 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare as nitrate that had lost to the bay, right? 
uh, urban centers, of course, also contribute quite a bit of the nitrogen load to the bay. And about 50% of that is coming from the from pond management. Right? So we click, quickly can zero in on which ones are the main um, time-wise, you know, where the, the, the need, not emissions, excuse me, the losses happen there. But with emissions, it's not a different. Uh, so do we need excess food supply? Yeah, because we need, uh, in some regards, yes, to supplement the variation that, that happens through years, of course, to, to keep the prices at the level that doesn't affect people with low income to access it, but it cannot be a mindless excess, right? Uh, externalities otherwise um, will essentially flood us, right? This, with what level of pollution we want to live in the world. That's some kind of decision that we need to make collectively, we need to make collectively in the price that we pay for our products. Armin, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt, but your sound is mostly good, but it's cutting out sometimes. I don't know if there's uh, anything you can do being closer to a microphone or anything that, that might help or not. Sorry for the interruption. No problem. I can come closer. I think one of the issues is that there is a construction outside. And I, I didn't go to the office because there is construction in the office, but they <laughs> start construction here too. And I think when they start hammering, it cuts off automatically. Um, that's, that's my only guess. Maybe I was so cut off that you couldn't hear it. We can hear, we can hear almost everything. It's just cutting out sometimes. All right. Well, we'll just carry on. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to be slower too, so maybe you know less is lost. I don't know if that's a reasonable thing. Um, so how about nitrous oxide? Me too. Um, well, you know, very quickly, nitrous oxide in terms of total nitrogen losses of all, all those big arrows that I should show is a very small component, very small. Um, it's just very important as a greenhouse gas. You know, it's a, a three atoms molecule that has, you know, the exact optical properties to actually trap uh, radiation that otherwise will be lost to the atmosphere or re-radiate part of it back. And therefore, it's a, it's a tremendous greenhouse gas. It is very difficult to measure the emissions, I mean, you know, from the soil because the concentrations are low and the instrumentation used so far tends to be a little bit expensive and not easily deployable, uh, but it is manageable. Uh, and of course, agriculture dominates the global nitrous oxide emissions, right? In the US at least, it's in the order of 80% of the nitrous oxide that is uh, emitted, it comes from agriculture. So that one falls in our lap, so to speak. You know, we have, we have the responsibility, I will say, to take care of this one. Um, very quickly, it comes from a relatively complex nitrogen cycle, but it's a manageable one. You know, we don't need to memorize everything here, but I trust that many of you know it well. I just want to show very quickly um, that the black arrows here represent what nitrogen comes into a soil plant system. It will come as fertilizer, that's what the F means in here, uh, that can be in uh, nitrate form or in ammoniacal form. Uh, can be nitrogen fixation through the vegetation. So the vegetation pool here is represented twice. And once you dump it into the system, so to speak, it will bounce around different uh, pools. And finally, some of it can be lost. Uh, we want that most of the nitrogen that we apply here is fertilizer through fixation to go through harvest so we can manage the flow later on, right? But many times, first, we add much more than what is needed for multiple reasons. And some of it will make it through uh, some losses. And some of the losses will be nitrous oxide loss. One of the losses is from nitrification. Just the process itself will release a little fraction of nitrous oxide, not major, but enough to be noticeable. And on the other, the one that is uh, the culprit of the big emissions is the nitrification that we will explore, explore in more detail later. And in an ugly uh, redox potential type of Graph, you know, it is represented here. When we add an ammoniacal source, you know, it will be further oxidized sometimes in the presence of oxygen to nitrate. And in the process itself, it will release nitrous oxide, that's nitrification. When denitrification kicks in, you know, for a, for a different reason, uh, in that case, nitrous oxide is an intermediate in the pathway. 
right? It's not a byproduct, uh, but an intermediate. It needs to go through here. And if this process is truncated here and the reduction doesn't go all the way to nitrate, to excuse me, to dinitrogen, we can get uh, tremendous losses of nitrous oxide. So just for a second, without looking at the whole uh, nitty gritty detail, look at this as a wheel, as a wheel that, you know, we are pumping nitrogen through and we are um, an ammoniacal source, you know, it will nitrify, in general, it will nitrify, release a little nitrous oxide. Some of it will go to nitrate. If that nitrate is available and hanging around there, it can get denitrified, release more N2O, um, and then you know, get to the atmosphere. Nitrogen fixation may make some of it back into an ammoniacal form, and they will continue. So the more we pump this wheel, the more nitrous oxide we get in it. So what are the ingredients for denitrification? The you know, there is the major source of nitrous oxide to go on. Well, we know it well, but we can review them very quickly. The viability of nitrate, you know, it's, it's essentially the substrate. Um, low uh, label organic carbon sources, residues, you know, greenish, easy to decompose, so the microbes can respire. So there will be the, the electron donors, essentially, and low oxygen. When there is oxygen, nitrate won't be used as, um, as an acetyl electron. And under four, the nitrification will be nil, near zero, right? Uh, but as soon as oxygen goes down, it kicks in. In that little phrase, as soon as oxygen goes down, that's a very loaded phrase, uh, phrase, essentially, because the soil, when the microbes are respiring and the roots are respiring, consume oxygen, and the source of oxygen is the atmosphere. Therefore, there is a bit of a gradient uh, between the concentration of oxygen in the air and that in the, in the soil atmosphere. And the regulation of the oxygen concentration in the soil atmosphere is the one that will enable or not uh, denitrification. It has to be low. If the concentration of oxygen is zero, meaning completely anoxic conditions, the nitrification goes all the way to the nitrogen. And it's a nitrogen loss from the system, call it a loss from the system, uh, but it's not a source of nitrous oxide. The problem is that in between, between a concentration of oxygen that is not very high and one that is not zero. And that threshold, um, it's a bit challenging to define exactly what it is, but you know, we will go through it in a second. All right, so let's go to the example that I mentioned in the, in the abstract, which is you know, what happens in systems in which we use organic sources. Um, so snapshot, the first quadrant here shows how nitrous oxide emissions usually look like. So here is a corn phase in a rotation. This line in here just represents a timeline through a rotation that's go through a cover crop, through corn, cover crop again, through soy, to a winter grain which is typical in some areas here in the, in the Northeast, right? And this corn in particular is receiving inputs of nitrogen essentially from a, the cover crop that is uh, killed, mow, and incorporated, as we will see, and manure. And right after these applications of nitrogen, you know, we get these peaks of nitrous oxide emission. So this pattern is very repeated in, in our system. Add nitrogen, and the thing is fresh in there, we get peak emissions, then they essentially disappear. It's very simple. The problem is that the, the, the exact timing of the peak, the, the length of the peak, you know, how long is that emission um, wave? You know, some people call it the hot moment, uh, is, and how tall it is, is extremely difficult to predict, right? Um, in the system that we were working, for example, in this case, and I will walk you through the one that is here, you know, in this little square, so you don't get completely, um, you know, you don't zoom out with all the colors and boxes. You know, this is the rotation with a green winter grain, uh, a cover crop of sorts, corn, cereal rye, soybean. And when there is uh, uh, manure broadcasted here and then a marble plant, we get the case in which the cover crop and the manure are added uh, in the soil at once. And we get the emissions right after, right in the two months after that which is essentially the wave that we are seeing here. So we will see, you know, how do we explain this, these emissions, how they matter, how can they be managed? Um, that's what happens at the feed level, at the landscape level. Sometimes we get a landscape pattern of emissions of nitrous oxide, which is a lot more difficult to detect because landscape can be very large, right? How do you measure? things everywhere and assign the source essentially of the emission. But for example, if we think of a conceptual 
uh, stream that is down here and a watershed, you know, that goes up to the upland here. And we have a crop plant, crop plant in the upper part and maybe switchgrass and any other covered in the lowland, some sort of buffer strip. You know, the fertilizer may go in here. Some of it will move uh, with the water. And when it is in an area that is wet enough to have low oxygen concentration, it might be denitrified. So conceptually, um, that the pattern of emission may look like this. This would be a normalized denitrification, meaning the nitrification is higher in this area next to the stream, but lower in the areas that are better drained. But the nitrous oxide emission will be a little different, right? The emissions will be higher where the nitrification just starts, right? But when the nitrification is essentially going at full speed because the oxygen is essentially zero, then there is no denitrification. So we get some sort of uh, nitrous oxide emission front that moves up and down the landscape during rain and you know after the relaxation event it starts moving down as long as there is nitrogen. That makes it difficult to, to measure. So do we see this type of thing in the landscape? We do. So here is, for example, a small watershed. You can imagine that the stream goes through here and drains on this part. So we have to cut it off here. There is a forest. Um, and the dots here show the intensity of the emissions of nitrous oxide. Here is pretty high. If you walk in this direction, you're going down to the stream. And if you walk up in this direction, you go up the stream. So it's kind of a V-shaped uh, watershed. Uh, emission high, 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 low, low, you know, all low essentially all around, high in the lower. And the color there is the, the, the amount of air um, in the soil. I hope you can hear me well now because my internet connection says unstable. Um, yes, it sounds okay, Armin, thanks. Perfect. Um, zero to 20, you see that there isn't much of a relationship between the, the circumference of these dots and the color, right? But as we go down in the water, in the soil to the 20, 40 centimeters, all of a sudden there is quite a relationship there, right? Between the spots that are emitting a lot of uh, nitrous oxide and the, and, the moist, and the air content in the air. And even a good correlation with the air real deep, 40 to 60 centimeters um, deep. So this is essentially hinting on some of the processes that are uh, controlling the emissions. You know, Mind you, many times we measure from zero to 20. Uh, stuff from zero to 20 is not what explains the emissions here. Let's keep going. Um, in the trial that I mentioned that I was showing you before with the cover crops where we had manure, I'll walk you quickly through. We went there, we measured nitrous oxide essentially twice a week during the growing season, collected in the thousands of data because there are too many plots. Um, and then we, you know, we are ourselves with all this data and we just start doing analysis that says, well, it's linear related to that. We can do a multivariate analysis. This and that is very difficult to, to discern what is going on with nitrous oxide because of the variability. But there is one, at least one method, you know, random forest among many machine learning methods that at least let you explore what variables are related to the emissions. It's essentially on, on you, on the analyst, to realize what are the relationships, but it tells you here are the variables that seem to have some bearing on the on those emissions, right? Um, so, and these are I'm plotting two different experiments. One is the one that I just showed you, uh, and with this published, and you can you know review all the analysis there, and it is telling that the emissions, you know, the further you are in this direction, you know, the more important the variable, the emissions tend to be related to how much manure is in the soil because we added it, the carbon dioxide flux, you know, the soil respiration rate, essentially, uh, the precipitation in the prior two days, and the legume biomass. These two are very correlated because of the timing of the emissions. I mean, legume biomass and manure residues. So if you remove one from the analysis, all the variance comes to the other and vice versa. Um, and, and very little with the water field per space, right? Which is usually the one that is used in many models to actually model nitrous oxide emission. So this is hinting that carbon dioxide has something to do with the emissions. A different experiment in a different, in a different location, although near, near this one, uh, which we finished essentially analyzing you know, two weeks ago, uh, is showing 
similar similar patterns. We didn't have the manure residual legume biomass here, so they are not in here. It's not a fair comparison, so to speak. But once again, carbon dioxide emission and precipitation in the prior two days uh, come up as the most important variable explaining the flux. So we did other analysis. You know, we look at the expression of of DNA. We look at isotopometer analysis, which means you know looks at the actual um, distribution of the of the isotope of nitrogen in the molecule of N2O, depending if it is bonded to the nitrogen or to the oxygen. You know, it's, it represents even more denitrification or more nitrification. In short, these emissions are from denitrification, the big ones, and and we need to explain how how that happens, right? And here is how the story seems to go. Um, Oh yeah, before that, there are interactions. Here is, for example, a plot of manure residue versus legume residue. And you can tell, you know, the edge here is when there is no manure. This is, these are the emissions that will happen if this is only depends on the legume. These are the emissions that will happen if this only depends on the, on the manure. But when we put them together, there is a synergistic effect. Right? Or there seems to be a synergistic effect uh, based on our analysis. There are a lot of interactions. I really can't bore you with this plot, which is one of my favorites. But when we develop what we call a feature contribution plot and plot, for example, legume residue against the variation, the emissions, you can see besides the color, pay attention to the color of that, but you can see that there is kind of a tight association and a threshold-like response. But it is telling that when it gets to this, essentially two megagrams of biomass or 1.8, then emissions are high and stay high. Uh, but below that, there are no emissions. If we look into this one, which shows the response of nitrous oxide emissions to carbon dioxide to respiration flux, we see a kind of disheveled, positive relation, but very disheveled. Uh, this type of analysis is tell that high respiration is associated with the, with the emissions, but it's interacting with other factors. That's why it kind of looks scattered shot a little bit, but upward. This one that doesn't have this. Uh, uh, that look and is tighter, it means that it interacts very little, is that regardless of other variables, this one will drive emissions high, more or less following that pattern. So we have a lot of hints that carbon dioxide is related, that legumes have a threshold type response um, and things of that nature. By the way, you see that the shapes are odd. This is the type of thing that you can do with this non-parametric methods. We are not tied up to a linear, quadratic or any other form, it just takes the form that the data takes, right? Um, so hints here and there of what drives the emissions. Um, how important are these emissions? They are, they are high. So I, we, didn't, we didn't talk about rates, but on an annual basis, let's say that a corn crop growing in the middle of Iowa uh, that emits five kilograms of nitrogen as nitrous oxide is emitting a lot. It also depends on the yield. You know, you have to scale this and depends on how much nitrogen is added. But if the crop is managed on average to have a, an average productivity and is emitting five kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, five pounds per acre, roughly the same, that's a lot. That's a lot of emissions. We are getting emissions in the order of 15, 11, 6, 3, 14, 12, 7, 4 quant. So these emissions are high, whichever way you want to look at, right? very high in some cases per year, right? Per crop, but basically, you know, that's the bulk of the emission in the year on the corn year. So what's the story? So why do I use the seesaw catapult? Well, when we talk about organic agriculture, the use of cover crops and the use of crop pasture rotations, which is, you know, one of my favorite systems, uh, we essentially have in our mind uh, a gentle process of nitrogen accretion and then decomposition during the during the cereal phase, then we plant a legume, nitrogen comes back, then slowly decomposes, if synchronized with the nitrogen demand. This is a very nice seesaw, right? At least in, in our mindset. Um, but here is what happens, what it seems to happen in reality here. So here is the representation of the soil with a cover crop growing, you know, a little bit of a, I think the drawing represents a bit of a modest roots in this case. Um, when we are going to plant corn, usually the cover crop is killed, maybe a month ahead or so. Skilled mow, which is this uh, green layer here, and represents that the, the cover crop has been mowed. And 
manure is added on top of it, and then a marble plow in some cases apply, particularly in an organic system where you know, people are trying to bury the seeds. Doesn't mean that the marble plow will go on every year, but this is the case in this experiment. And therefore, all this layer of manure and cover crop that was there ends up here at the bottom of the profile. And the upside down roots just represent the inversion. Of course, as you can tell in the picture, the inversion is not perfect, but it's better than, than what that picture lets you see because we, we, we look at it, we put sand color and, and we take soil samples. And when you take a soil sample, very often 20 centimeters below, you get a bit of a salad of the cover crop that was just buried, which is kind of amazing. So you get in a, in a system that this is simplification, but looks like this, right? Plant the corn and it looks like this, right? So what happened in that case? Well, oxygen will come from the atmosphere and it will be consumed intensively by the microbes, particularly during, when the heat wave hits those 20 centimeters, right? During the daytime, excuse me, in the middle of the afternoon, right? Heat is moist, the roses are fresh. We just added green leaves, you know, with manure. So you get a lot of respiration. When we get respiration, we assume that we didn't measure in this experiment, but we are measuring now, that the oxygen concentration goes down, that the diffusion of oxygen down just cannot replenish, cannot keep the soil at 21% oxygen, right? And therefore, it hits that boundary in which the nitrification kicks in, but because the pores are open, uh, oxygen doesn't go to zero. Therefore, nitrification is de the denitrification is truncated, and a lot of the emissions happen. Oxide. It's kind of a nice story that we told ourselves, but we haven't been able to knock it off, meaning, you know, can we prove that we are wrong? And every, everything seems to go in that direction. So experiments that we are doing now are essentially measuring the oxygen concentration in the different soil layers, uh, you know, while we have the system and we have changed the distribution of the, of the residues, you know, distributing through the surface, through the whole layer to see what happens with oxygen and with nitrous oxide. It's a little advanced. We haven't been able to tamper down the emissions with the methods that we are trying, uh, but we have a good idea on what to do next. So there is more evidence that this process is operating. Um, yeah, well, I have a summary there that, you know, essentially here we have a denitrification, a truncated denitrification reactor going on in this way. You know, we, we, when I was working with this, we came up with this idea of oxygen consumption in this field. Actually, it was working with the students in a project in, in Italy. Uh, we took students to an area in the island of Sardinia. Here is, you know, mainland, mainland uh, here is Rome, mainland Italy. And there is a small area with a drain marsh uh, that is very sandy, as you can tell in the, in the bottom, and it's flatland, right? Essentially, a sand dune that is flattened and, and is managed to, to produce corn silage and receives a lot of manure. So you can see the silage. Um, been there. And when we started measuring nitrous, uh, nitrous oxide emissions, which, which was meant to train the students to measure the stuff, we find humongous emissions from the business as usual uh, experiment, right? This is an emission of 27 kilograms of nitrogen uh, as nitrous oxide in three weeks. I, I, I don't know if this is a record, but if it isn't, it's very close to it. In three weeks, you know, I just said that five kilograms in a year is a lot. Uh, 27 in three weeks is really a lot. It also has this pattern of very high emissions. What caught my attention in the system is that if you dump water, it just never ponds, right? Water will flow through, will flow through because it's a sandy soil and it's very porous. It doesn't have any silt, basically. So nothing clogs the pores. And how can the emissions be so high? Well, it's a similar case. Usually the, the addition of the slurries of some types add label carbon. That label carbon triggers very fast respiration, creates a small gradient, uh, uh, excuse me, a sizable gradient in the oxygen concentration, most likely, and, and trigger this massive denitrification. Nobody suspected that denitrification was that prevalent there, but it is. So we are onto something I, I would think. We can measure these things. So here is one of these models that you know cycles was developed in, in our lab. And you know, if you have inputs of things, uh, you will get outputs of things. And in the outputs, one of them uh, is nitrous oxide. And therefore, we can test what happens with this at the larger scale. I can advance that the model, I don't want to use the word fail, but let, let us say that doesn't represent 
uh, nitrous oxide emissions with the intensity that we see in the field when the nitrogen source is, or is, is from organic manures or, or cover crops. Therefore, it hints us that we are not, you know, there are some processes that we are not representing well. We are working on it. I really love when that, hap love when that happens because it means that we have a lot learned. And when something is learned and you fix something, many things go on better, right? But we are working on it. So when we run this model, for example, in all of Iowa, uh, in essentially in every CLU, in every field uh, in Iowa, which is in the order of you know, 800, 8,400, 8, almost a million fields, uh, we get patterns of emission of nitrous oxide. Uh, this is not a simulation. Um, well, in this case, it is a simulation in which the same system was, was simulated uh, all across Iowa, but we can represent the actual management or something close to the actual management, including the manure management, with about maybe 25 or 29 percent of the area of, of Iowa receives some form of manure, right? Particularly the corn. So we are we are in a condition to do assessments of nitrous oxide emission and how to suppress them at a very large scale. And we can optimize systems in silico too. So uh, here is an example of of running. And the model cycles in the Chesapeake Bay is being modeled in every now in every county. But the uh, the example that I want to put here is that you know before we tended to use the model in a way well we want to try this scenario and then you run this scenario. But now with the advances of of, uh, of computing power, we don't need to make those decisions. Essentially, we can ask the system to start developing scenarios that will optimize for something. You know, uh, you know, for one variable or for many variables. And in this case, you know, we are just generating rotations uh, just to see that, um, for example, in this case, you know, in the northern parts, more or less where you are at in, at Cornell, uh, or the ones that are at Cornell, you know, it tends to alternate corn and soybean, for instance, and and as you go south, you know, it makes room for winter wheat uh, in the rotation. Now, this is a very simple simulation. The point is that we can start doing this to learn, not necessarily to follow the advice of the computer mindlessly, but to learn faster. You know what can be done. Trade-offs are an important one because, as you can imagine, uh, if we are concerned about losing nitrogen as nitrous oxide, you know we might think ourselves: we, we, do we favor leaching, which sounds like heresy? You know, for us, we don't want nitrogen to leach. Uh, but if you don't want to leach, it may be lost as, as nitrous oxide. That's more or less what we are doing with the cover crops, right? We use them to trap the nitrogen, but we mind, you know, what we learn is that well, now that we have it, we just put it together with labeled carbon source. And if we put them in the soil, we better manage that process, right? In a way, we need to learn how to manage it because in the, in the wrong conditions, it will be an emitting time. And how are those, those the nitrification fronts? Okay, we are a little behind on that one, but we are working on that. So here is a watershed and it has been triangulated to represent different processes, right? In which every single spot will be simulated by the water that moves uh, that drains essentially, or that, excuse me, not drains, that, um, the water that goes over land, runoff, will be received by the next cell over, and the water that moves in the groundwater will be received by the next cell over. So you have a physically distributed mo uh, model of water that lets you trace essentially nitrate movement. And if this works, you know, we will be able to see a very quick um, movie here. Let's see if it has, there it is. So what you are seeing there is that you know we put some pollutants can be nitrate or anything, and the colors that you see here are the concentration of the of nitrogen in the groundwater. As you can tell, you know this ones you know they are all connected because of the pattern of drainage, and the colors that you see here are the changes in concentration in the stream. Right? You see, is two years of precipitation going through. Here is this little bar, essentially showing the rain events, and you see how this starts getting cleaned up because the pollutant essentially is getting emptied out completely. And in the next rain, I think, is finally completely cleaned out. So these models let us learn about the patterns of water and nitrogen movement in the system. You know, it will depend on which crop is there, you know, which ones are the sink of the nitrogen that is being removed. But it let us trace what are the areas where you know, doing an intervention to reduce uh, nitrogen losses, being those leaching or, or nitrous oxide will make more sense, right? Or at least let us think without guessing too much. You can just do this experiment in the field, but you can at least learn using these models. All right, so how important is nitrous oxide? Well, today it's maybe what, 10% of the signal, a little less than 10% of the greenhouse gas signal. 
but it will become more important the better we control fossil fuel emissions, right, and land use change. And as we stabilize carbon in the air, carbon dioxide in the air, and maybe it starts going down, um, nitrous oxide and methane will become more relevant. So this thing is not going away. We really need to get, we really need to get a handle of it uh, soon, and because it will be more important as time goes by, because it becomes a more important greenhouse gas the more we control carbon dioxide. That's, I think, something that we need to be aware of. I do recommend uh, that paper that is there on the screen because um, I think they made a very good point. So there are a few challenges to manage nitrogen. One of the things that I, I presume uh, uh, will be managed by, by Corinne in the, next, in the next presentation, but one of them is that we need to match the nitrogen supply to the nitrogen demand, but the nitrogen demand is not fixed. It depends on the weather every year. Here is the variation in yield, for example, you know, through year in, in, a, in a given watershed. You know, if we budget for this demand of, uh, if we budget for the average, we are going to be short here and in excess in the other, years, right? That's a problem that we all know. It doesn't go away. It does create a problem for nitrous oxide. One issue that I didn't manage uh, mention much, but it's, I think it's, it will become more and more important is the use of manure. Uh, when we add 100 pounds of manure to the soil, we add 100 pounds of manure. And if we have a good scale, it works. But when we add manure, we may add the mass that we want, but we not necessarily know the composition. It varies a lot. Common sense tells that a uh, producer will tend to over apply uh, just to be on the safe part, because if the composition is variable and it hits the average, half of the time will be short. Therefore, we add in excess, which means that the excess, the actual excess, is will be really high, right? Uh, that's a big problem and one that we need to work on. And the other is cover crops. So I think we need to promote them and we need to learn how to use them uh, to prevent them from being a source of nitrous oxide. There, there are, you know, research is underway there. Doesn't mean that cover crops are bad. That's, that's, you know, I really would hate for that to be the takeaway. What I mean is that like anything else in agriculture it needs to be managed. The graph here, by the way, in this case, is showing the variations in nitrous, in nitrogen leaching in a watershed. The dots are measurements. The other are, you know, modeling attempts. You know, the watershed that I just showed you there. And the important thing is that the high emissions essentially are showing when there was enough nitrogen in the system to have high nitrous oxide emission rates too, and it varies a lot, right, in that watershed. All right. So in conclusion. Can we reduce nitrous oxide emissions? Yes, we can. We need to find the leaks and we need to plug them. And, and they exist, and the more we measure, the larger they seem to be. Uh, that's an important message there, measuring things. Um, there are means to, to improve nitrous, uh, nitrogen fertilizer use. Uh, there has been great progress, I would say. Maybe it's uh, underrated uh, how good some producers are managing nitrogen, but there is definitely worldwide a lot of room for improvement, not only in the US, but worldwide, you know, China in particular, and, and other areas where nitrogen might be used in excess. Uh, we do need to refine the management of uh, organic sources of nitrogen. Uh, this is a uh, very important one. I'll, you know, there is research going on, but we need to really tackle this one full on. And there are trade-offs. There are trade-offs that are local. The trade-off of how do we manage nitrogen to prevent leaching, but to prevent also nitrous oxide emissions, there can be a trade-off there. Uh, but there are trade-offs uh, globally too, right? Uh, if we produce, for example, less grains and those less, the lesser production of grain will require less nitrogen, we will lower our uh, nitrous oxide emission footprint, so to speak, as long as that grain that we don't produce here is not starting to produce elsewhere, right? In which case we might be doing uh, a really bad Faustian uh, bargain there. All right, um, here in the figure, uh, it's a figure of the students uh, learning how to use automatic chambers, you know, with Margarita uh, and Antonio, two Italian scientists. Uh, it was a great project, you can tell, the sandy soil there, here is the barn there from and some of the manure pits. And I think I put the, the, the figure there to say that transparent markets need information. And in, in the case of nitrous oxide, in many cases we are we have a lesser knowledge that I think is ideal uh, to enable a very transparent market to follow. So we need to measure things and that will make us uh, definitely learn progress and, and make this work. The acknowledgements to the students that, and others that have contributed a lot, uh, I will highlight a couple. 
the Bastish, which did a lot of the work in the watershed that I mentioned and in the one of the cover crop experiment. Alison, that is working now in the current iteration of the cover crop experiments, and Rachel, that single-handedly managed to almost single-handedly managed to simulate all of Iowa. Um, Felipe has developed a semi-automatic method to measure nitrous oxide that essentially made the research feasible. Finally, the funding sources that were kind enough to trust us with their with their funds to do some of the research, USDA, NSF, and one DOE grant and one EPA grant that I uh, forgot to add here. All right, uh, Jennifer and, and Peter, that's uh, that's what I had to say, and we'll be happy to take questions if we have time. I will Thank read. you. Thank you so much, Armin. That was fantastic. Um, uh, we're going to take some questions right now. Uh, if you have other questions, please add them to the Q&A. Jen is going to post a poll while we're doing this part. Um, so Jeff Miller asks, with greater infiltration, would you have more NO2 loss, or do you mean N2O? So more loss under no-till? Uh, um, it can, so the answer, it depends. It, it really depends on the system. And sorry to answer, it depends. but. You have to have the three ingredients at once, the low oxygen, the nitrate, and the source of carbon. So if it is not teal, that maybe the soil might be moist, which probably leads you to think that it can have more nitrous oxide emissions. In some cases, yes, but if the nitrogen is added underneath the residues, let's say 10 centimeters below, the nitrate is there ready to be denitrified, but the carbon source is not. So the nitrous oxide emission might not necessarily be that high. Uh, after a few years of no-till, another funny thing happens is that macropores develop and they tend to keep the soil pretty well aerated. Uh, that doesn't mean that the emissions are low, but there's, you know, there seem to be higher nitrous oxide emissions in some no-till cases, but not always. Hope that answers the, the question. Um, the next question happened uh, about halfway through your talk. It's from Jennifer and it's not really a question. It's it, You'd think CO2 would be correlated with soil temperature. So it is odd that the relationship to emission is so different. Um, it is, it is. Uh, sometimes we don't have enough of a variation in temperature to see it. So the range of temperature variation in the soil is not that large when we measure, when we are measuring the decomposition. But yes, there is a very tight relationship. And yes, high temperatures will tend to favor the nitrous oxide emission because of the consumption of oxygen, for sure. That's, that's a good point, actually. So one of the, one of the management practices that we, we found may lower the nitrous oxide emission is adding the manure or the cover crop in the, when possible in the fall and burying it. Of course, that makes it a source of leaching, but it slows down the consumption of oxygen. That thing decomposes much slower and therefore they, it doesn't create the conditions for big blips of nitrous oxide. It's a lot more uh, gentle. So Jennifer also asks, are you optimizing for yield to minimize nitrous oxide in the simulations? We can. We haven't, you know, we haven't done it exactly for that, but we can. We can optimize for anything, but, it's, but we can, I think. Okay. Uh, every time that you optimize for reducing a loss, you get a little, you know, uh, hammer down in the yields, which tells me that our obsession sometimes to measure, to manage crops, to close the yield gap, is a little bit, um, maybe we need to be a ways below the, the yield potential to really tamper down emissions. Jeff Miller says, what role can enhanced efficiency end sources play or biological end fixation products applied to corn? I don't know. I think in general, anything that will reduce the viability of nitrate uh, the collocation of nitrate and an easily decomposable carbon source will reduce emissions. Uh, and fixators, you know, soybean, for instance, will it tends to emit less nitrogen uh, because we don't add nitrogen that is freely available. The plant gets it and then we'll remove it right with the grain. But if we have an end fixation and then we keep that fresh residue with a lot of nitrogen in the system, well, you know, that one is a risk for sure. Okay. Um, and then Jennifer add, says, adding on to Jeff Miller's question, under no-till, let's assume organic with legume cover crop killed with a roller crimper and a well-developed 
uh, and well-developed macropores to facilitate good gas exchange through the profile, would that suppress denitrification? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, that's a great question because in that case, the residue will be in the surface, right? Um, I think it will depend. I was surprised in Italy at the high emissions in a soil that was essentially a macropore itself, right? Uh, sometimes the macropores will create the conditions for low denitrification, but high nitrous oxide emission because it permits essentially for that nitrous oxide, first for the oxygen to get in, so there is no anoxia, but the other is for the nitrous oxide to leave the system before getting further reduced. Um, so I say that if the residues are in the surface, probably emissions will be low unless you get a frozen ground and then you get a, the, the denitrification reactor right on the surface, which happens when, when there is no melt. Um, but it's probably lower, but it really depends in the case. And I think it will be, yeah, I will be a little bit too, yeah, I will be cautious actually giving you a, yeah, I'm sure this will happen. I, I'm not so sure what will happen in that case. Okay, so Ethan asks, have you researched impacts of different cover crop mixes, particularly grass legume mixes on nitrous oxide flux compared to single species leguminous cover crops? Yeah, glad to, that's a good question. Glad to, glad to get it too. Yes, we are doing that right now. And we have one year of data in which we measure very carefully uh, in a combinatorial experiment, you know, what happens when we have grasses, triticale in this case, uh, clovers and a mixture of both, and and things more or less go as planned. The grasses tend to be tend to have much lower emissions, right? But a little nitrogen stress crop. Um, but yes, they do have a they, there is a difference, you know, by a factor of two if the, if it is a grass or if it is a legume, roughly, very much related to the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the of the inputs. Yeah, good question. So Brian says, great information makes my head spin. Um, uh, Trade-offs abound. Historically, the goals were reducing soil erosion and optimizing fertilizer use and protecting water quality. Maybe the new metric we need is a system approach that measures the total carbon footprint of a given farming system. Yeah, I think I, I think I think you're I think you're right. And and I think um, Maybe it's not for us or either, either academics to decide what the system should be, but I think the public should have very transparent information to make this call on where do we put the weight? Uh, you know, where, what is for, what do we wanna pay for? Uh, lower emissions, lower leaching, it probably will vary by area. It depends, you know, what is your worst problem? If your problem is drinking water, nitrous oxide shouldn't be the main, priority, but in areas that don't have that problem, maybe nitrous oxide should be, particularly we have manure additions uh, where the emissions can be grotesque. Um, so yes, it is it's definitely a, a complex subject. It can be a system, carbon footprint, carbon, carbon footprint is one, but there are, depends what is the most uh, pressing issue locally, right? Uh, the problem with nitrous oxide is that when you emit it, you made a problem with everybody else. So you made a minuscule problem for everybody else. But if everybody makes a minuscule problem for everybody else, we end up with the atmosphere that we are having today, very high emissions. Okay, our last question is from Jeff. Any work being conducted to develop manure application equipment that can apply later in the season through injection? Uh, Heather Karsten and maybe others. Heather Karsten in, in, in our department has been working heavily on that. And uh, definitely the manure injection decreased some losses. Now, uh, volatilization for sure, but it, it does increase nitrous oxide emission. Um, so here is a, there is a trade-off right there. Thanks for introducing all of the trade-offs today, Armin. It was a fantastic presentation and um, I hope the rest of your sabbatical goes well. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.